This is Mead here, and this video is going to be about laying out a landscape painting in black and white. I've already done a preparatory drawing that's not pictured here, and I've done a quick sketch to lay out the canvas, bringing in um, uh, info from that preparatory drawing. So I always begin uh, with a large one inch brush um, if I'm painting something small. This is an 8x10 uh, piece of paper here. And um, wh why I do that is just to cover a lot of ground really quickly. I had a drawing teacher that said, you know, 90% of drawing is covering the paper. And, you know, I think to a point that that's completely true and really literal. It's like once you cover the canvas, then you can really make decisions. And so that's your kind of first goal is to get everything blocked in so that you can start comparing uh, colors and values to each other. Now here I'm painting front to back, starting with the foreground layer. It might be, you know, better or more efficient in certain situations to go from uh, back to front. But in this case, you know, I'm just going to go for it and uh, start front to back because I'll wind up making several passes anyway. So it's not going to matter by the time it's all finished. Um, and by the way, this is in real time. You know, we're not going to speed up or anything like that. Um, on the palette, I usually just mix up a not quite black, a not quite white, and a middle gray. Um, in fact, for this demo, I'm actually using Golden's neutral gray number five, which is right smack in the middle of the value range. And that way I don't actually have to mix the gray. Um, I do a lot of brush mixing for landscape. It's totally appropriate though to mix uh, with a palette knife as well if you want more precise values. Um, and what I'm always doing when I mix paint is uh, compare the values that I have on on the palette and kind of make sure that I'm matching values or creating new ones if I need to create new ones. The first thing that you do um, when you're laying out with this particular method, and this is not the only way to begin, is to um, focus on creating the silhouette of the landscape itself. Um, in this case, the foreground's very, very dark anyway. The middle ground's kind of in the middle, and the background's pretty light. So what we're going to do is we're just going to spend a lot of time on the on the silhouette here. And then once we get everything covered, then we're going to spend, spend a lot of time refining and changing values um, to get something more accurate. And um, this is kind of a reductive process. It requires multiple passes. It's uh, relatively indirect um, because you are going to go over the same thing multiple times. But I find that gives you good opportunities to make corrections and changes and improve the painting. So whatever marks you want to make here, they're fine as long as you're keeping them simple and making them specific to the, to the landscape at hand. Um, and that kind of goes for any painting, whether it's landscape or portraiture. Now, um, one of my students had a question here with this tree, which was, hey, you know, like there, you can see through the tree in a big way. Um, almost every part of the tree is a little bit transparent. And what do you do with that? So my thought on it is that where the leaves get really dense, I'll paint it solid, even if there is some transparency there. If I need to come back later and blot and like push in the sky color a little bit, I'll I'll do that. But that'll be kind of after the fact. And then where there are big areas where there aren't any leaves, then I'll leave those blank. But I don't want to spend too much time at this stage in the layout, um, draw like painting or drawing individual leaves in there because that's a little bit too tedious. Um, you know, if it's necessary in the end, maybe you could go to that level of detail. Most of the time, it's probably not all that necessary. So here you can see I'm working on blocking in those large areas and leaving a lot of open space where I know that there's not going to be a, a leaf or there aren't many leaves. And it's on segments like this where you kind of have to slow down a little bit. Um, I know it seems like I'm moving quickly through it, and I guess I am, but um, 
I could probably move slower and more carefully. But uh, since this is the first, you know, first layer of paint on the first bit that I've uh, that I've worked on, I think it's okay to move a little quickly and preserve that energy. So here, one of these little tricks is uh, these are these are like little bits of floater leaves, which aren't really connected to the tree per se, but they look like they could be or should be. Um, so having those little marks that kind of dot outside the, the silhouette of the tree really help. Um, and one of the things that you notice that I'm not doing is I'm not differentiating any values in this whole segment. Everything's just 90% of the way to black. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm working on creating a graphic representation of this painting. Um, I'm not getting to the light yet. I just want to see is, is my design of this painting going to work? Um, and, you know, one of the things that my students did working from the same reference photo was created like a little more of a, of an angle to everything. So I brought that into my painting too, because I thought that, that was a really great idea. Um, originally I had had it more flat in my sketch. So what we're trying to do is just evaluate at the very beginning of our process, whether we're going to have a successful painting or not. And if we don't think it's going to be too successful, what can we do to change it before we go any further? Right? Because if you can head off problems at this stage, um, that's the best situation to be in. Um, if you can't head off problems at this stage, you'll have to correct them later. And usually the later in a painting that you correct problems, the more work it's going to be. So here I'm coming in with that middle gray. Um, that was a little bit thin there. So I'm going to come back a little more opaque and I'm basically going to put one flat middle gray over the entire middle ground section, even though there are multiple things that I want to paint in there and there's differentiation with light. Um, there's a, you know, the lake and the uh, hill here are both part of the middle ground, but they're all going to get the same value. Um, it just doesn't matter at this stage because what I want to evaluate is, is the foreground shape good? Is the middle ground shape good? Is the background shape good? And do they interact well together? And that's the only real question that I have. And so this seems pretty simple. Um, and again, what I'm doing here is I'm focusing on that the, the silhouette, the outer edge of that of that next layer. And I want to be sure that everything interacts well, that I don't create tangents. Um, if you're not sure what a tangent is, I'm pretty sure I've explained that in other videos um, with, uh, with drawing. Maybe I should do a video about that, just tangents. So yeah, working carefully. And I'm trying to fill up all these little white spaces without going over the foreground shape too much. Although I don't really care because in the end I'm going to have to come back and restate the foreground anyway. So it's not a big deal. And there we go. You know, so many uh, painters are very good at going straight in with color, but um, if color seems overwhelming, I think it's really worth it to do some black and white paintings. Um, it'll teach you a lot about how the light works and um, how the paint itself works and how to choose values and differentiate shapes. You know, here, when you have color, you have a lot more ways to differentiate shapes because you all have the color itself and how light and dark it is. Um, but here you only have how light and how dark stuff is. And that makes it a little more difficult, but um, it allows you to evaluate things on a more fundamental and simpler level. And the other thing too is this could be a way to start a painting. You know, you can start in black and white and then add color after you 
you know, make all your major decisions. Um, one thing to note though, is that when you use black and white, the most intense colors are going to show up in the middle values. Um, you're going to get light colors, but they're not going to be like, you know, color wheel intense at the, at the very, at either end of the lighter darkness scale, right? Um, you should probably have fairly saturated colors in your darks, um, and not as saturated in the lights. But your your highest saturation, what we would call your like most intense or brightest, although brightest is a kind of misleading word, those kind of wind up in the middle values. So here I have a lot of work to do because I'm painting front to back of meticulously going in between all those little gaps and blocking in these gray areas. If I had painted back to front, I wouldn't have to do that because I would have painted the the silhouette of the black areas over this and it wouldn't be as much work. So just something to keep in mind. If um, There's no right or wrong way to begin. You can do it either way. And I think you should probably try both. But just keep in mind that that's kind of the sacrifice that you make. And here, just cleaning that, clean that up a little bit, make sure it's kind of flat. It doesn't have to be perfect on this stage because you're going to have to re revisit it again anyway, at least once more, if not two or three times more. Now, going into the background, you need something that's a uh, lighter gray, but not perfectly white. Because if you look at the, at the reference photo, the background has, has a distinctly darker feel than the um, than the sky. So it may take a couple shots to get that value right, and you'll probably only get it right once you block in the sky as well. And here I'm making some changes to the silhouette because the silhouette is a pretty, and the photo is pretty parallel to the middle ground, and whenever you kind of parallel shapes like that it's not as interesting so anything you can do to break up parallel shapes um, is going to be worth it i think and again a lot of focus here is on this outer edge that silhouette just because that silhouette's going to give us a lot of information um, early on in the painting process. Um, some other notes about materials when, while we're just watching this segment. So I'm using acrylic paints. I'm using golden. Um, it's pretty good. Liquitex is also good. Um, to make the paint stay on my palette a little longer, I'm using Retarder, which is just a slow drying agent. So that means that I can do a whole paint session without worrying about the acrylic drying on the palette and not, I mean, not having any more, uh, paint to use because of that. Um, I also am using a Liquitex Ultra Matte Medium, uh, which is very, very flat. And I enjoy it because when you take pictures of the work, it's, um, not very reflective, so the pictures come out nicely. Um, you know, when you use glossier surfaces, I feel like it looks a little plasticky. Um, and I guess with the matte surface, it kind of tends to look more like a, a gouache painting. Um, I'm trying out these brushes for the first time, these, uh, these Aspen brushes, and they're pretty good. They're kind of like a medium stiffness. So I'm enjoying them. And then as far as which brushes that I use, I use a uh, one inch flat brush, a one half inch flat brush, which I'm using now. And I use a um, number six to number eight round brush. I find that that works, the round brush works for both sketching and for putting in, putting in um, any details at the end that the flat brushes can't hit. But most of the time I tend to paint with the, uh, the half inch flat feel like it's a general good size medium between coverage and detail. 
Um, for palettes, I use a glass palette. Uh, the one that I have is gray. So that's really nice um, because it's not white or black. So I kind of know where I'm starting. Um, so here I'm working into the sky. I know that the clouds are going to be pretty dark. Um, they may be as dark or darker than the background um, value. When I look at the brightest part of the clouds, it's pretty close to white. And then the blue of the sky is a little darker than the white, but it's still pretty, um, pretty bright. So this segment probably isn't going to have like a great amount of differentiation between the clouds and the sky. It's just when you would paint this back in color, it would, uh, it would help. To differentiate that one of the things to keep a note of when you're drawing or painting clouds is that you're looking up at them so you should think of each cloud as having like a, a bottom plane to it usually the dark areas of the cloud especially in this situation are the bottom so you can think of it as sort of like a cylinder that's really organic chopped off somewhere through the middle and you can see the bottom and you can see the top. So what you'll wind up doing is you'll have kind of two basic sides to the cloud where you'll paint the bottom side and you'll paint the side that you can see above the bottom. One of the things that you'll notice is that um, there's a pretty good value range in the in the clouds themselves um yeah basically from almost pure white to um just above middle gray so that can kind of mess with the the foreground middle ground and background elements uh, generally speaking the closest clouds that you would see looking out of the landscape are going to wind up being in the middle ground just because of the tendency we have to lay things out in a certain way. Um, clouds in the foreground would be ones that you're looking up directly at and you would have to have like an extremely wide angle view or lens on it. Um, so you can think of the, the clouds as being middle value part of the, um, a middle value part of the mid ground here. So here we've got the basic dark pattern of the clouds laid out. It's not completely done, obviously, because we need to lay out the rest of it. But that's the gist of what's happening with the clouds. And with this method, you know, even the areas that are that are white are very bright. I'm going to want to paint there um, just to build up a surface. If I don't do that. Uh, by the time I go into color and everything, it can be a little weird. The paint won't flow as, as readily. I find that paint flows really well over paint, but not over paper in this case. And as you do this, you probably want to just slightly modulate or modify the value as you put it down with very subtle changes so that you create slight differences and a slight progression throughout the area. So even now you see how this is going to be some of the brightest area in the painting and yet there's just a little bit of gray in it. Um, I think it's good to pull the values of the painting just off the ends and kind of focus on what the values can do for you in the middle. The reason for that is the middle contains more color. And when you go to colorize, then you'll have more room to add color in the middle. You don't have a lot of room to add major color differentiations in this in the darkest darks and the lightest lights. 
So on looking at this again, you know, I might make changes after this whole thing is done to be sure that I get a good progression. Because the general progression of light to dark is going from uh, bottom to top in the clouds. Now it's looking like the lightest parts are really probably somewhere towards the, the very far background, maybe even in, in the middle of that segment. But with painting in this way, you know, sometimes you have to go over it multiple times to get it to get it to work and to figure everything out. But at this point, we more or less have the painting blocked out. This last segment of gray will complete the block in. And at the block in stage, that's when you can kind of begin to evaluate the the um the way that you've composed everything um you don't have to it doesn't have to be like perfect at this stage um it's still kind of a messy ugly painting but what we what we're looking for are f a few fundamental concerns one of them is is the composition in interesting um are we leaving are we framing out the middle of the painting in an interesting way do we have any parallel lines that we need to take care of? Are there any tangents? Um, are we uh, prepared to create something that's of visual interest? Um, do we have a, a potential place to put a focal point in the painting? We ask ourselves all these basic questions. Am I transitioning out of the corners or is the composition kind of dying in one of the corners? So. If you can answer all those questions, or at least think of them um, and address all of the concerns that you might have and make changes, that's the best position to be in. So once you're done with this, you're going to start differentiating uh, various shapes. So um, up there in the clouds, there's some differentiation left to do and some tweaking. Uh, down in the water, that's the next major area to differentiate. And this probably isn't going to be the correct value for the water. I'm just, what I'm doing now is just differentiating shapes. Once all the shapes are differentiated, you know, all the planes that you want to focus on, then you can come back and actually refine them. But right now, as long as you're differentiating shapes, you're fine, right? Because that's definitely too dark for the long term. So this next stage of the painting, now that it's covered, is to go in and uh, paint in all the sub shapes, the, the sort of uh, shapes within the foreground, middle ground, and background. And once those get laid out, then you can begin to refine and make changes to the value range. So here I'm mixing some color, get back to it in a second. Oh, I should also say when you're painting, uh, be sure uh, every, every once in a while to take a break both for you know proper ergonomics and for being able to take a step back from your from your piece. If you get six feet away from your painting and kind of examine how it's going to read, um, it'll tell you a lot about what's going on with it. So if you go away from your painting and you can't differentiate shapes or you can't really read it, the composition's not clear, that's a signal that you have to come back in and make some changes, which is totally fine and is totally expected. It's part of the process. So here I realized that this middle ground shape needs to go darker for the most part. There's going to be one pop of light on there, which I probably won't touch. Um, and then there are little rocks in the water too that are quite dark. So I'd have to put those in as well. So this is where you start to push and pull values darker and lighter. <laughs> 
So what I've done here is, you know, I created a problem by not going this dark in the beginning, but I didn't know how dark it really needed to be. That's okay. Um, and so now I've diagnosed the problem, like, hey, that looks too light. And now I can fix the problem, go in and mix a darker, um, a darker pile of paint and put it in. And again, every time I do this, it kind of destroys the silhouette of the tree a little more. So I know that I'm going to have to go back later and bump up the silhouette of the tree. But I'm going to do that after I get the value relationships of everything um, kind of settled and then do the tree. So I feel like if I keep restating the tree and, and making changes behind it, I'm doing a lot more extra work rather than just a little bit of extra work. The next thing I want to do is go into the foreground and start to subdivide some of the foreground. Um, the differentiation in value here is going to have to be, is necessarily very, very subtle. We don't want to draw a lot of attention to the foreground. We just want it to be interesting enough so that if anybody looks at it for a while, there's some, st there's some attention paid there. We want to keep it low contrast. In this case, we want to keep everything really dark. We don't want to pop a lot of brights in there because then we're going to ruin the function of the foreground, which in this case is to frame out the middle ground and the background. One of the nice things about having this gray value in the middle is I know that if I mix the gray and the black together, that I'm going to be kind of in the right range on the dark side. Um, you know, mixing black and white together is, is tricky. So I think I might keep doing this for a lot of grayscale paintings. It's kind of, it's kind of an interesting method. Um, because you know that generally speaking, what's lighter than that gray is going to go in the light. What's darker than that gray is going to go in the dark. So it's a really simple kind of, uh, method for thinking about it. And I really kind of like that. So there are some layers that I want to subdivide to this foreground. I'm doing that with just slightly lighter dark grays. They look a lighter, lighter than they are on the video because it's um, getting some reflection, but that's okay. Sometimes pulling that um, gray up into the silhouette will help too, depending on how you've differentiated the shapes and how you want to differentiate them. So here, adding these little bits of dark gray in there, they also help transition out of the corners. Um, the larger compositional shapes of the foreground um, don't really quite act enough as transitions. Um, and what I mean by that is we're kind of guiding you around the painting, keeping you out of the corner, bouncing, your, bouncing you back in with these triangular shapes. One of the things you can do too is um, if you think you have a value you might need for another section of the painting, go ahead and just dab it and test it on the painting. And then you can make refinements from there. Any necessary details um, that are distinctive, you want to put in the put those in whenever it's appropriate or whenever you see it. 
Um, not too early on, of course, but definitely now that we're in the middle stages of this of this little study, it would make sense too. Yeah. So now we have a lot of differentiations going on. So we're going to enter a different phase of the painting now pretty soon here. Getting specific about how these little rocks interact here. Okay. There we go. So now one thing I've noticed is that I need to change the value again on this middle one. Keep pushing that value. It's going to need to go uh, even darker, but just a little bit because it really has a very close relationship with the foreground value. Yeah. There we go. So you see how this next phase is going to be all about um, value judgments and changes. One of the other things that I noticed is I didn't like that background shape. I still don't want it to be parallel, and but I didn't like the way that that interacted very much. So. Um, even at this stage, I can just go back and change it. Um, it's not a big deal. We're still barely out of the blocking stage. So we're not at the point where we're finishing and we can't make big changes. I mean, even if you are at that point, you could still come back and, and make dramatic changes to the pieces. So one of the things to think about is how do you how do you differentiate shapes then when you're done differentiating shapes you can see every shape in the painting that you need then you're like well how do i get across the sense of atmosphere or light in the piece that maybe my reference or, or the outdoors if i'm painting outdoors is kind of telling me um do I increase contrast? Do I decrease contrast? Do I go for um, direct or indirect light sources? Is it an, a situation where there's a lot of ambient light um, sort of coming through on a cloudy day? Um, and then you think about how dark or how light the values need to be to get there. And sometimes you'll put a dark value down and it doesn't look good and then you have to come back and lighten it up and then maybe that's wrong and you have to darken it just a little more. Um, you work kind of back and forth in multiple passes. You know, as you get a lot of more experience, you probably will have to correct less. But even now, um, working with this um, kind of strict of a method, I do have to go back and correct a lot, which I don't mind. I like painting. If you ever don't know what to paint or don't know what to don't know what to draw, I think um, it's simple just to pick one of the four main subjects, whether that's architecture, landscapes, people, or objects, and just go ahead and paint something. Uh, don't think about it too hard. It's more about painting's more about what what you see and how you see it. Um, ultimately, it's the shapes that you choose that matter a lot. So. Um, you know, painting kind of starts and ends with shape because you can only ever really paint shapes on a canvas. It's just why you paint the shapes, how you paint the shapes, that all matters. That all builds your style and um, allows people to connect to the, to the work that you make. You know, here I've gone and I've darkened that middle ground up. That's 
Probably darker than a middle ground would normally get, but this particular lighting situation I think calls for it with a little bit of light coming through the clouds here. It's kind of patchy. Um, I want to be sure that if a plane or a shape kind of continues behind another shape that I make the value changes through the whole shape. Um, that's really important. Sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that you need to, um, that you need to carry a shape through other shapes. Um, that happens all the time where you run right up to the edge and then you just kind of stop and you forget. Um, you know, here are my students pointing out the, uh, the middle ground and foreground area there. And we're talking about the fact that I've lost a lot of information in the foreground and that's true. I know that, that the foreground's kind of getting a little messy and I'm gonna have to come back in the end and, and, uh, and make, some changes but for now I just keep going work towards this uh, work towards this background um, one of the things that I noticed is that I can um, lighten up this far background and still have a fair amount of contrast there so that's what I'm doing here One of the nice things about painting in, in kind of flat graphic shapes with relatively hard edges is that you can get away with the most subtle of value transitions. Um, if you paint with a more blended style, you have to have higher contrast. You can use lower contrast between shapes if you paint in a flatter, more hard edge style. All right, next we're going to work back into the sky. Just spend some time on that because it's probably the least um, the least paid attention to so far. And I want to be able to have a decent sky. So one of the things that that I've kind of noticed is I have a lot of opportunity to bump up with pure or like nearly pure white. Um, just to begin to push that contrast apart a little bit. The other thing too is that these clouds kind of currently have a lot of hard edges, so I want to soften those edges as I go. Part of softening edges though is um, pulling values closer together. Yeah, there we go. So I'm kind of creating like transition values and little in-between values that aren't quite as dark as that gray, maybe even covering over that whole gray or nearly all of it. There we go. Yeah, so this cloud at the top it's not really flat. It has a lot of differentiation. So we want to be able to, you know, run in there and, and differentiate a bunch of uh, slight changes, which I think is, is both fun and really necessary for this one. Um, you see that there's like a main dark gray value, but then there's a lot of subtler, lighter values in there too. They're still fairly dark relative to the uh, brightest part of the clouds, but they need to get uh, brought up and made a little more sophisticated. There we go. 
so this is kind of nearing the the what i would say like the end of the layout stage um the demo has about eight minutes left roughly and we're kind of nearing the completion of our job our main job was to differentiate differentiate every shape in the foreground, middle ground, and background and create an interesting design. Then our next job was to differentiate uh, smaller and smaller shapes within this design. And then um, our final job is to restate anything that we've lost. And sometimes we don't even have to do that at the end of the stage. We can just move right on into color and know that we're going to do it then. Um, you know, our, our kind of final, like, major job, I mean, restating is kind of important, but it's inevitable. But our major ones, after we get our shapes subdivided out, is to get the correct values in every shape. And that means we may have to make major or minor changes to any given value, right? And that's what we're doing here. We're saying, okay, well, this was kind of the correct value, but it's not exactly correct. We probably need to change it so, some. So we'll need to um, push values darker or push values lighter. And I always compare it to the values that are on my on my palette when I'm mixing. I can say, oh, I used that value for this section. I need to go a little lighter or a little darker. So I have something to compare it to while I'm mixing. So that it's not just... Um, you know, kind of rough guesswork. And you'll notice too that I've painted a lot of these sections more than once. And that happens. So now I'm kind of pushing the, the light in the middle area and then I'm losing the distinction between the mid-ground and the background. So that means I'm going to have to do something to change the background too. I feel like this value is a little more accurate to what we have going on. This way it should feel a little more like light falling on this than a random patch of paint that's slightly lighter. And then the other thing too is you can start thinking about um, whether you want to use gradient transitions, right? So one of the things that you can see is on that background um, mountain shape, it's uh, significantly darker on the left than it is in the middle, and it's a little bit darker on the right than it is in the middle, but only barely. Um, so you can begin to think about that, of how you're going to handle those gradient transitions. The other thing too is when you start getting into lighting, you need to start being very specific about the shapes and where that edge is and how that edge interacts because you're getting to the point where um, these kind of things begin to matter a lot. So here, because we lightened up that area on the light side of the, for of the middle ground, we have to go back and we have to lighten up the background. But we have to also make sure when we lighten up the background that it's darker than the sky and that when we squint at it, we're getting something similar or like a similar effect as the reference photo. And I think even going up values this dramatically, we're still able to hang on to that. Because you can see if you squint that the rough amount of contrast is similar. You know, it's always different going from a digital photo to an analog painting because you, know, you have screen brightness and in the uh, in the photo. And you don't have that level of brightness when you work in analog media. <laughs> 
And here's the stage where you kind of just start to really slow down and think just as much as you paint. I mean, there are several stages where that's going to happen where you just kind of really think about the brushworks, really try to analyze, don't lose that um, sense of where you're going and where you've been. Um, one of the things you'll gain from doing this repeatedly is you'll kind of know what stage you're at and when to move on to the next stage. So because this is in the far background, this also has to get lighter. Probably has to be lighter than our middle ground um, or, or the front mountain in the background. There it is. So you can see how this background value now has a good amount of contrast, but not too much. And um, it's not too little either. You can clearly distinguish that from the sky, which is what we want. So one of the things that you probably noticed is that the lake here isn't very bright. It's differentiated, but it's not the correct like value that you would want. So it's going to be worth it to mix up something fairly bright and put that in there. Um, you also notice that there's a little bit of a transition. It's fairly bright on the right side, and it's darker as you go uh, to the left. So we want our our um, values to um, reflect that or to use that knowledge. Right around where there are the dark marks is probably where we'll end it. And once we get this in, that'll kind of wrap up this layout stage. I know that I didn't go back to to restate all of the foreground and I'll have to do that. Um, but when this demo kind of continues into color, then we can talk more about uh, restating that as well. So here, this is wrapping it up. What we've done here is we've differentiated all the shapes uh, into foreground, middle ground, background. We've divided up the sub shapes. We've uh, softened any edges we need to soften. And then we've gone through and we've pushed values into more or less the correct range where they need to be to make a reasonable landscape.